Uh, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to present here today on COVID-19 and older adults with an intellectual disability, and really the perspective from the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability. It's the first dedicated centre to investigate key issues in ageing, intellectual disability and the life course. It's underpinned by the Intellectual Disability Supplement to the Irish Longitudinal Study in Aging, IBS Tilda, which many of you may be familiar with, and we have many participants from St. John of God Services. And the centre is very much focused on advancing world-leading research, scholarship and training to identify the determinants of health and well-being for adults aging with an intellectual disability. And IDS Tilda, it's now in its fourth wave, so we'll have nearly 14 years of really good health data. And the objective was to understand the health characteristics of people aging with an intellectual disability, to examine the service needs and healthcare utilization of people aging, to identify the disparities in health of adults with an intellectual disability as compared to Tilda findings for the general population and to support evidence-informed policies, practices, and evaluation. And having the data from IDS Tilda was really critical and fundamental to our understanding of risk factors for people with an intellectual disability during the pandemic, because now we had really good health data and social care data as well on this population. So uh, when the world changed in January the 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared an outbreak of COVID-19 to be a public health emergency of international concern and declared it to be a pandemic on the 11th of March, 2020. So the Trinity Center for Aging and Intellectual Disability uh, tried to respond and to assist services throughout the country and indeed throughout the world informing people on, with an intellectual disability, developing a host of easy materials on symptom issues around protection and self-isolating and testing, treatment, uh, health promotion and mental health. Um, we also uh, kept the internet people with intellectual disability in the public conversation, which we felt was really important to easy read materials, but to radio interviews, press statements and blog posts. And we shared others' resources. So we collected resources that many services in Ireland, indeed, including St. John of God, have developed a lot of very nice materials, as well as other our colleagues at an international level. And we gathered all of those resources together and we included those on our website. Clinical information, health promotion, information around people living with, with autism and, and family and caregiver supports, etc. So it became this reservoir in terms of that people could access resources quite quickly. We also held a series of webinars which were very much aimed at the ID sector and supported the ID sector. And we held a series of those across the pandemic and you can see the title of those there. And they're available to download for people who hadn't been able to join some of those from the website. Well, we've already had um, over six and a half thousand people attended the webinars and we had have had thousands of downloads from those presentations. So people found those uh, uh, quite helpful, uh, particularly at the start of this pandemic. Uh, we also wanted to look beyond the medical response and infection control. And we wanted to understand how people with an intellectual disability were adapting to what was called the new normal and what they were doing differently. And we sent out a call to people with intellectual disability from all over Ireland. And we got thousands of submissions of the wonderful artwork, images of what we've been doing, poetry, stories, etc. And we created a very nice short video clip, which is on YouTube, celebrating the creativity, innovation and resilience of people with intellectual disability during the pandemic. And this is also available on our website to download. But when we begin to think about the risks around COVID, we now know that there are two different risks for populations. And the first risk is there is the increased risk of adverse infection outcomes. So that is uh, uh, the outcomes if you get the infection, and there's increased risk of contracting the disease. And I just want to talk a little a bit to you about those two issues. 
So firstly, if I look at the increased risk of adverse infection, infection outcomes, we know now that those most at risk are those who are age 70 and over, those who have an organ replacement, receiving cancer treatment, severe cystic fibrosis, severe respiratory conditions, asthma, COPD, heart failure, diabetes, and obesity. We were then able to look at the data from IDS tilde and look at so, some of these conditions to help us understand who would be more likely to be at risk with an intellectual disability. And what IDS tilde taught us was that those with mild to moderate intellectual disability were more likely to develop and have diabetes. The likelihood of developing diabetes increased with age and women were more likely to develop diabetes than men. So these were high risk. We knew now that this was a population at increased risk of poorer outcomes. We also knew that obesity was now another health risk for poorer outcomes uh, from COVID-19. And we understood that 80% of people who were older with an intellectual disability were overweight or obese. And this indeed was comparable to the general population with the data yielded by TILDA. Those with mild to moderate intellectual disability are more likely to be obese, and those living in community group homes and living with family were more likely to be overweight or obese, and women were more likely to be obese. So this raised concern of the potential for poor out health outcomes for this population. We also uh, showed that hypertension rates were, were less than this, people with intellectual disability than the general population. They were more likely, though, to increase with age, and there were higher rates of hypertension in women than in men. So this was important data that we now had at a population level in Ireland for people who are aging with an intellectual disability. And then looking at the second major issue, that was the increased risk of, a, of infection, those with increased risk of contracting the disease. And we now know that people living in residential settings, healthcare workers, people with reduced capacity to understand and to adhere to health guidelines and other occupations requiring close proximity. Just having a quick look at what the international data has, is telling us, and this is changing, of course, all the time. So some of the data that I'm speaking to, you know, is, is probably old at this stage, uh, but we are keeping abreast uh, on, on what's coming out. So UK study looking at data to May, but they reported was similar overall case fatality for people with an intellectual disability at 5.1% and those without ID at 5.4%. But that there was higher mortality rate in adults aged 18 to 75 years with an intellectual disability at 4.5% compared to those without an intellectual disability. A Welsh study again looking at data from March to May showed similar mortality rates for people with intellectual disability and the general population, but that age standardized rates of deaths for people with ID was three to eight times higher. A Dutch study, which is, has more recent data, reporting up to the end of October, suspected COVID-19 infections, they looked at 3,490 3, people with ID, 67 patients with a confirmed diagnosis had died, and mortality rates of 11% were reported among people with ID with a confirmed infection. So this was, was quite high. Um, Pauline Haslip's work looking at the, the, the UK study, she reviewed 50 deaths of people with intellectual disability from COVID-19. Increased infection risk if with mobility impairments and mental health needs. Increased mortality risk if, for those with epilepsy. And one in five of, review, of reviewed cases were discharged from hospital, but they were readmitted soon afterwards. And UK and Ireland looked at a review of 66 deaths of people with ID from COVID-19. A mean age of death was 64 years, younger than the general population observed high rates of moderate to profound ID, 54% of 43 people, so they were at increased risk. Those with epilepsy were also increased risk. Those with mental illness, dysphagia, and Down syndrome and dementia. A UK study estimated a fourfold increased risk of hospitalization and a tenfold increased risk of death related to COVID-19 
for people with Down syndrome. And this was after adjustment for cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases and care home residents, which explains some, but not all, of the increased risk. So then just looking at increased risk of infections in other residential settings and comparing general nursing homes and intellectual disability settings. So we know that 22% of all nursing homes accounted for 22% of all cases and 56% of all deaths. And this was up to the end of June. So this was in the first outbreak. And the biggest source of outbreaks was private nursing homes up to the end of October. ID residential settings, there was no evidence of comparable widespread outbreaks, and that was up to the end of October in ID settings. So this is of interest. HICWA assessment of nursing homes identified characteristics of outbreak-free facilities. And what they reported was those who were outbreak-free were compliant with regulations assessed, comprehensive contingency plans, proactive and resourceful regarding resident safety, quickly implemented infection prevention and control measures, they were vigilant in monitoring residents for symptoms, and they adhered to the public health guidelines. And HICWA highlighted previous gaps in clinical governance and linked with community health programs, compliant with regulations assessed, comprehensive contingency plans, proactive resourceful regarding resident safety, quick, quickly implemented infection control measures, vigilant in monitoring resident symptoms and adhering to public health guidelines. And HICWA called for review of uh, staff skills and skill mix to ensure access to enhanced nursing staff and advanced nurse practitioners. And HICWA findings were supported by the Nursing Homes Expert Panel Group. And I think when intellectual disability services, we had uh, intellectual disability or a good level of perhaps of nursing uh, support uh, within, the, within the system. And I think this was particularly helpful during this uh, pandemic. I think when the nursing home expert panel also questioned existing models of residential care in Ireland for older people, and for people with an intellectual disability age 55 years or above, Less than a quarter, 23% now live in residential or, or more congregated settings. And the largest group within this cohort, 38% live in group homes in the community, which typically house less than six residents. So this may be a factor in the different infection rates between ID services and older person services. And it has certainly shone a light on the lack of the um, unsuitability of large congregated settings, either for people with an intellectual disability or indeed for the frail elderly. So I do hope that this causes a change in direction in terms of, of, of long-term care provision for people who are aging. Uh, the international literature has also identified increased anxiety and depression and other mental health impacts of the COVID-19 crisis and an elevated risk of mental health impact of COVID-19 in those with pre-existing mental health disorders. So this was also a concern and should be a concern from up for us, because what IDS tilde has shown us is that over half of the IDS tilde sample, 52%, reported a diagnosis of a mental health disorder, and this was prior to COVID-19, and 32% reporting anxiety, 16% reporting depression, and 15% reporting mood swings. Inclusion Ireland did a survey of the impact of day service closure during lockdown, and they reported a 33% increase in anxiety, 38% increase in behaviours of concern, 56% reporting significant loneliness. And they also reported that 30% reported a positive experience by day services closing down. So, I think there was something to be learned and we need to listen to the voice of people with an intellectual disability as we begin to reopen and build back services. Family Carers Ireland survey of the life course of carers during lockdown, they also reported that 63% uh, were concerned about declining health and well-being of the person they cared for. 60% of carers were concerned about their own mental and uh, health and well-being. 
and 56% concerned about increased challenging behaviours of their family member. So as we begin to build back better, I think the UN, the United Nations has, in, has developed a policy brief, um, a disability inclusive response to COVID-19. And while building back better, it is critical that people with disabilities are part and parcel of the response which countries are preparing. And these responses of well design can address the uh, exclusion and discrimination faced by persons with disabilities thus creating more resilient communities and system, systems. Um, so I think that is important. I, I want to thank the, the team, and this is my own team here at TCID, but I also just want to say to you that we have um, administered, we were in the middle of wave four of IDS tilde when the pandemic, uh, pandemic struck. And we um, went back and we have administered a COVID-related uh, questionnaire to all our participants, to over 750 participants and their carers. Uh, we have had very good health data, so it's a really unique resource over many years. And we will be publishing the COVID report, will be launched by the Minister uh, for Disability on the 3rd December. Uh, and I'll give you more information on that. So this will be um, a covered report on, on, on older adults with intellectual disability that were enrolled within IDS TILDA and we will be launching that on the 3rd of December to mark International World Day of Intellectual Disability. I just want to again thank all of the people who've been involved in the work we've been doing, particularly our participants, families and carers, our various committees, advisors and our funders. And all of the information I've spoken about can be downloaded from our website, and that is a web address here. Thank you.